ready to go. So it is seven o'clock on Monday, August 19th, 2019. And I call to order this regular meeting of the Richfield School Board. In attendance this evening, we have board members John Ashmead, Peter Tensing, Paula Cole, Christine Malik, Tim Paulus, and I am Crystal Bracky. Uh, Superintendent Yunowski joins us at the table. We will strive to remain focused on Richfield Public Schools mission statement. Richfield Public Schools inspires and empowers each individual to learn, grow, and excel as we conduct our meeting this evening. And really pleased to have so many people with us here tonight. I know many of you will be speaking at some point in the agenda, but still, it's wonderful to look out and have so many people with us. And hello to our loyal viewers on YouTube as well. <laughs> um, our first item of business is to approve the agenda before us. Is anyone prepared to move the agenda as presented? I'll move the agenda as presented. I'm second. So we have a motion by Ms. Malik and a second by Ms. Cole. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye and the agenda is approved. Uh, so moving into our information and proposals non-action item section of the agenda. This evening, we did have time for public comment at the beginning, but did not have any members of the public <clears throat> sign up. So just want to say here that the next opportunity for public comment will be at our meeting on Monday, September 16th. So we move next into the superintendent update section of the agenda where we have several items and presentations. So I will turn things over to Superintendent Unowski uh, for this section of the meeting. Absolutely, so before we step into the business components of the superintendent update, just wanna have a conversational update about some of the construction going on within Richfield Public Schools. And as, may, as you all may have noticed, obviously our buildings and our grounds are a little bit torn up at, at this time, along with some of the streets within our city. Um, and so I just wanted to update the board on some of the things that are happening and coming out from the district as we work to communicate um, where we are in this process um, and sort of take next steps in our construction updates. Um, and so obviously, as you know, weekly updates have been posted to our website, um, but we are now entering a time as our brand new teachers came back today to begin their training. Um, to begin updating the community and just reminding them where we are in the construction process. And so our communication will start with one big overall reminder that construction is set to go through almost two years from now. Um, and so people who are noticing that our construction is nowhere near done, that is correct. Our construction <laughs> is not supposed to be anywhere near done. Um, and so the first completion of any of our projects is actually slated to be a year from this summer at the end of summer. And so we really aren't expecting to be done um, anytime this year at all. Um, and so that's important for people to remember. So we are going to have buildings under construction over the course of the school year um, as we phase things in, of course, protecting our classroom spaces, protecting our ability to provide an effective education, um, but still continuing on with our construction. Um, we have construction at three main sites going on right now, um, of which we plan on sending a letter update um, via email and Blackboard across the district. We'll also be sending a phone call out to acknowledge to people that we have a letter in email, and also we'll be posting it on Facebook, we'll be posting it on our district website, and we'll be posting it on Twitter. Um, just updating the community as to where we are in the process. Um, and also, obviously, if there are concerns or questions about what might impact how things typically go at our school, um, we're gonna be outlining those to each of the schools. Um, and so at Richfield High School, some of the things that we are anticipating, um, and we had a presentation at our last meeting, but it's just a reminder of where we are in that process, because we're still two weeks from school. Um, as with the end of school, kids are gonna be entering through door five, um, which is right near the athletic department. Um, and that is where we ended school because the entrance is still gonna be under construction with the commons area continuing to be under construction. Um, with regard to our kitchen, um, we have contingency plans to make sure that our students are still able to get um, school lunch and meals, um, including different options for hot meals. Um, and we're partnering across the kitchens within our district to make sure that our kids are going to be served. Um, we will have cafeteria space and the ability for our kids to eat in the high school. Um, in the first couple of weeks. It'll be similar to what they will do over the course of the school year. Um, so we really aren't worried about that. Um, but we are, again, building in contingencies whether or not the kitchen is, is ready quite on time. Um, our classrooms are moving together quite quickly and we do anticipate our classrooms being ready on time. 
Um, and so we are not expecting any significant impact to education in terms of kids getting in and out of the building, kids eating, um, and also kids being able to learn within their classrooms. Um, over at RDLS and STEM, we are in a similar boat um, where we are working fast and furiously to make sure that we put classrooms together. Um, we have had um, a couple of small bumps that we're not sure exactly where they are going to land. Um, some of our built-in casework may have been delayed. Um, again, we have put contingencies in place. Um, so for, for example, at RDLS, um, we may or may not get some of our built-in bookshelves and cabinets on time. Um, however, we have procured temporary cabinets and temporary bookshelves, which will be placed in um, if we are needed and if those things are needed. Um, and then similarly with the RDOS kitchen, we don't necessarily anticipate that being ready on time, but again, we're gonna be partnering, um, doing bag lunches and also partnering with the STEM kitchen to make sure that things aren't, things aren't changing the way education goes. Um, it's gonna be nip and tuck as far as similarly the entrance at RDOS to determine will we be entering in the front entrance um, or the same side entrance that kids had, had been entering and exiting on during the end of the school year last year. Um, and that would just be a one week, two week situation. Um, each of these things that I think we've talked about and we've shared um, continue to be uh, works in progress and things change on a daily, on a daily basis and they're, they're moving quite quickly. Um, so plan is that tomorrow um, we plan on sending our first communication out. Um, we then will be continuing to update and we'll look at another communication um, coming out from principals specific to their buildings um, right before the start of school to make sure that we're, we're doubling down on that communication. And with that, I will take any questions. And if I need to lean on Craig or Andy to support in this conversation, I will. Um, but if there's any questions about construction updates or where we stand, happy to take those at this time. I have a couple. <laughs> yeah. So the, the district-wide communication will go out tomorrow, if I understood that correctly. Correct. And that will, thank you, it gives, yeah. gives you time to come up. Um, the district-wide communication will tell families at those three sites that they will be receiving a more specific update prior to the start of school. Is yep. that accurate? So the plan actually has us posting on the website an update on what's going to be available by Open House, and there's kind of some guidelines around that. Um, we are working on details, so there's some traffic pattern things, the entrances where literally this changes day by day. Um, as far as we can do this, we can't do that. Um, originally, for example, STEM was planning for their open house to be outside. Now it looks like it will be inside, but we're waiting for a confirmation on that. So that's where um, our expectations right now are formal letters and e-blasts going out at the beginning of next week um, before open house making those final announcements, but doing an update on the website that would have that current information so people could access that and see how that transitions on a day-by-day -day basis. So. Um, that, that's the plan that we have right now, um, making sure that people have the advanced notification, but also wanting to make sure if we send something out as an e-blast, it is everything we reasonably think will be exactly the way it is versus telling people it's going to be inside and then finding out that it now has to be outside again. So, yeah. so that's the plan that way. Okay. I think just so people know where to go yep. and, and that the district wide communication tomorrow points people to the places yep. where they can get that most updated yep. information I think is great. The, um, the inside outside thing was actually one of my other questions. Yep. What are our um, weather and contingency plans for outdoor um, open houses? So right now STEM is planning to have their, um, well, again, it's kind of a, a cafeteria option. It's looking like it's going to be inside at STEM. Um, at RDLS, if it ends up being a weather increment, they have secured Veterans Park. Um, with the, um, the, the, the pavilion the yeah. as an alternative location for that so that it still is a covered space is what um, Mark had shared specifically on that one specifically. So. Um, where is it buying, especially if we have to go to a completely different place? And how our family is going to, and I drive by STEM every day. I have no idea where parents are coming into those buildings or parking, so how, how is that? Parking? So that'll be, that's one of the things that we're waiting anxiously to make sure that the back parking lot for the bus drop off is gonna be available. We don't wanna communicate, here's the plan, because that is, everything is lined up for that to happen. As we get closer, we come, become more and more confident about that. So right now, it looks like the back parking lot behind Dual Language School is scheduled to be completed mid 
next week, um, actually the um, 28th and 29th. 28th and 29th of August. Um, so as we get closer, we become, become more and more confident about that. So the buses will be coming in that back entrance, dropping off for STEM and RDLS. And tomorrow, actually, I have a meeting with um, both AIM, Principal Shasvand and Principal Winter uh, to do some planning on exactly what are the logistics for that main parking lot where the drop-off will be for both STEM and for the dual language school. Um, but essentially, the parent pickup and drop-off would be in the main parking lot on 70th. Um, we're just trying to figure out the supervision and management of that so that, that um, it's really pulling good. it off of the streets, which is one of the ultimate goals. Um, and we have a couple different plans on how that will work out. Um, either way, I think we find in most elementary schools where there's a lot of pick up and drop off there, it requires a lot of management mm -hmm. and a lot of this works, this doesn't work and doing some problem solving as things move through that process. Um, currently it's designed with both a um, much like the airport where there's a pick up and drop off mm -hmm. lane and then there's a bypass lane so you can move past one set of cars into the following set of cars. We're working on some of the logistics, just knowing there's a lot of people in at one moment and then out at the next moment, especially on the after school side of things. And the but that, that stuff that would be communicated in these letters that are going out at the beginning of next week. And traffic controllers in the streets, any plans for that? For parents like... That's what I we're just, working on. <laughs> I just, it is going to be so much better than what yeah. we have had for the previous drop-off. I'm oh, yes, really sure, excited yeah. about the yeah, increased level of just calmness and safety that will yes. be there for our kids. Yeah, there. definitely better than 12. Yes, it was a long time ago, but I used to drop off at that school and I found it a little scary. So. Mm -hmm. And yeah. some of the challenge, obviously, as Craig's pointing out, is we don't want to communicate and be wrong. And so right. that's why we're doing that overall piece and then getting more specific as we get um, closer to the dates. Anything else? I, I just, I'm kind of excited that from what I understand, all the bathrooms will be done and new. And I'm very excited to see that. Because that was a big area of concern for many people. So, is that accurate? At all? <laughs> yeah, we had a plan. No, except for, except for two on one floor. <laughs> yes. So bathrooms. I mean, bathrooms are one of the occupancy standards, right. mm -hmm. and having an established number of bathrooms, whether every single bathroom is completed, but there will be enough bathrooms that will be fully functioning and significantly different um, yes. than what has been experienced in Richfield. My one other question is just related to the meals and um, that in, you know, potentially a couple of buildings, we're going to need to have some creative options and just wanting to make sure that there are plans in place and knowing our nutrition department, I am 100% confident there are, um, but for people with dietary restrictions um, to ensure that they're getting what they need and that it is set aside for them for um, whatever days or weeks that we need that. So I'll, I'll make a note of that. But okay. Yeah. You know, I do. <laughs> She's on it. She, she was thinking about this probably since the start of the summer, knowing that it might happen and working with colleagues and putting plans together. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? All right. So as of tomorrow, communication begins. Um, with that, I am excited to officially um, bring up to the microphone a couple of our new partners. Um, we have talked at a board level about um, YMCA Beacons Boys and Girls Club and our 21st Century Grant. So just as a reminder, um, we applied for in collaboration with YMCA Beacons um, for a 21st Century Grant to provide um, enrichment and community activities within our schools at Centennial, Richfield Middle School and Richfield High School. Um, we received a three-year grant totaling just under $3 million. Um, which will be the equivalent of turning Centennial Richfield Middle School and the high school into what is similar to a community center, um, something that Richfield sorely needs um, and activities for our students to engage in after school is out. Um, it pairs very well with our academic programming that occurs after school and helps us provide those comprehensive opportunities to all of our students. Um, two of our partners are here tonight to talk with us. We have Jenny Collins, and we also have Richfield graduate Haley Tompkins. All right. Um, who have been partnering <laughs> us, with us from the start um, from Richfield Beacon. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to them, and I will drive the, I will drive their presentation. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'm Jenny Collins, and um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. We're so excited to share with you our 
passion and excitement about connecting young people to opportunities through Beacons. Um, I want to first thank Dr. Anowski and Dr. Roby for their partnership and leadership in pulling this um, grant opportunity together. Um, it's been a really exciting and quick journey and we're kind of building the bike as we ride it here. Um, it's been really, really a pleasure to work with the amazing team here in Richfield Public Schools. Um, and we're just excited to get to know more of the community as we move forward. Um, if we can move, thank you, to the next slide. I'm gonna just uh, go back to that picture of New York City for just a moment, if we can go just that one, perfect. So I'm gonna start where it all started. So um, I've actually been connected uh, with Beacons for about two decades now. Um, started um, as a, a younger person, a college student working as an intern back in one of our early centers in Minneapolis. Um, but Beacons originated from New York City. And I like to start with this image just to reground folks that Beacons is not just a program. It's really a citywide approach to connecting young people and communities to creating solutions to challenges in their neighborhoods and cities. Um, and so Beacons really started as a policy initiative in New York City. Um, in the uh, early 90s, there was a crack epidemic and there were crime challenges in the city of New York. And folks came together from community organizations, young people and parents and said, we need a solution to some of the challenges facing our communities, and that solution needs to start with our young people. And so they, uh, rather than the original plan, which was just to place more police officers in the streets, they partnered um, to do both a, a crime intervention as well as a crime prevention initiative through the Beacons work, and created the first ever citywide after school and community initiative through Beacons. Um, that then went national, we can go to the next slide, and today we have cities all over the country that are implementing this model of beacons in their cities, um, which essentially, uh, as Dr. Wynowski said, transform schools into youth centers, active community centers, and really create beacons of hope in neighborhoods, building on the strengths of young people, families, and communities. Um, this is a citywide policy and programming effort, so we are really thrilled to be able to partner with all the leaders and stakeholders in Richfield to build something together that helps really create young people, um, create opportunities in partnership with young people. And this, for those who are familiar with the community schools model, this is aligned with that community schools model and really has youth engagement and student engagement at its core. We know this is so important because young people have the equivalent of a full-time job when they're not in school and they're not sleeping um, that they have available. So 2,000 hours of time in their year that's available, which is the equivalent of a full-time job. And we wanna fill that time with learning opportunities. We also know we have gaps around race and income in terms of access to after school, summer, and learning enrichment opportunities for young people. Um, and we have gaps along those lines of, of race and class in particular in our region that we're searching to close. Um, and finally, we know that when we can address those opportunity gaps, that also translates into impacting achievement gaps for young people in regard to their learning. So we're creating a Richfield Beacons Network. This is very exciting. Um, we have had a network in Minneapolis prior to this for 20 years, so we do have um, some, some proven methods and, and we've learned a lot from that work, but this is a brand new effort in Richfield and we're gonna build it together and really identify uh, how we can build on the strengths here, uh, learn from you all about what's needed in Richfield Public Schools and in the city of Richfield. Um, and so the key partners you'll see on the slide, uh, Beacons, we have the Richfield Public Schools, we have the YMCA, uh, the Y of the Greater Twin Cities serves as our fiscal agent and our lead agency for the Beacons Network. Haley and I work for the Beacons Network and we really connect all the dots to each other. Um, and then we have our lead agencies in the schools. So the YMCA will lead in Richfield High School and the Boys and Girls Club will be leading in Centennial and in Richfield Middle School. So bringing all those partners together, lining up the best of what we have to offer for young people uh, to get really um, great results in partnership with our youth and families. And those stars symbolize all the other partners that are yet to be connected. So as Dr. Ronowski said, this is a grant from the Minnesota Department of Education. It is federal funding um, that will allow us to launch the Beacons Network in Richfield, serving K through 12 students and their families, a three-year grant with the possibility for a three-year extension, with the YMCA as the lead agency for the Beacons Network and for Richfield, as I mentioned, and Boys and Girls Clubs as the lead agency for Richfield Middle and Centennial. And this is what we're about. We engage young people, systems, and communities as partners to create equitable schools and communities by emphasizing belonging, relationships, enrichment, and learning. 
as we turn schools into community centers that run free high quality programs after school and in the summer. So this is a slide you can come back to if someone says, let's be good. <laughs> and I'll turn it over to Haley to talk a little bit more about um, what the model looks like on the ground in a moment. But just to close with, this is really our vision is that young people are successful and they succeed as 21st century <laughs> leaders and learners. And um, we have some core goals and we really rigorously evaluate our progress and our outcomes and work with our partners to do that around closing gaps in access to high quality on school time opportunities and developing 21st century skills to prepare young people for college work and life, increasing school and community connectedness for young people, um, as well as increasing academic achievement, uh, keeping young people on track for high school graduation and connecting all of those stakeholders together to collaboratively coordinate our resources on behalf of young people. Great. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you all a little bit about what it looks like on the ground. So kind of at the core of our model is this, is this collaborative partnership between an academic partner, both at the district level or at the school level, and then a youth development partner. And these are kind of some of the core key pieces, right, of the key components around strong leadership. We both bring expertise to the table that there's a lot of shared communication and coordination and shared planning that happens. Um, so here's a little bit about what happens in the programs. I can talk about this forever, so I'm just going to, excuse me, we just roll with me as we go really fast through. So we've got ladders of leadership. Leadership is a key component of our work in Beacons. Um, and young people, we really see young people as leaders today and want to engage them in opportunities to lead all throughout kindergarten through 12th grade and beyond. Uh, Beacons also, uh, the Beacons way is our culture really of belonging and connectedness that we work really hard to foster and hold. Um, engaged learning, we know that young people learn in lots of different ways and after school or out of school time is a unique opportunity for young people to really learn in hands-on ways and engage in their world and learn, learn in new ways. Um, family and community partnership, um, you know, we connect family and community partners to schools. Jenny mentioned those stars. Uh, that's really one of our strengths in Beacons is weaving those together. In Minneapolis, we work with over 40 different youth serving organizations and other partners to bring those resources into schools and young people out to those resources. Um, and then finally, program choices. You know, youth voice and choice is key in Beacons. Um, and we want to make sure that young people have a robust menu of opportunities of new things to learn and explore. Uh, so briefly, a day in the life at, a, at Beacons. So you, uh, we'll do a snack, right? We'll provide a healthy snack. We'll do an opening circle, a community building activity. Um, often there's then the enrichment activity that, that enrichment um, can look like, I mean, you name it. We've done rock climbing, we've done tennis, we've done cooking, we've done dance, we've done step, we've done, I could go on for another 10 minutes about those. Um, and then we do an academic enrichment component, which is often, it has been in Minneapolis where we have a classroom teacher, we work with the ALC or targeted services um, and weave those together so that for young people, families, it's one phone call, one form, one program. They don't see it as I go to this, I go to Beacons and then I go to ALC. They see it as one piece that's all kind of stitched together for them. Um, the Beacons Network, like Jenny mentioned, that's us. Hello again. Um, so briefly what we do in the Beacons Network, I have this written down so I can go fast. Um, so the main thing is resource development. We manage our shared grants. We manage the 21st century grants, so y'all don't have to do the reporting. We'll take care of all of that. Um, as Jenny mentioned, data-driven culture, Beacons has a very data-loving culture. We do rigorous evaluation citywide. And we're excited to be able to tell a citywide story beyond even just what's happening at our centers. Um, Cross-agency professional development. We not only coordinate professional development for youth workers, but we also provide capacity building and technical assistance to make sure that our programs are of the highest quality and well supported. Um, collective vision, that's one of the biggest things we do, I think, which is really bringing folks together, building will together, planning together. Um, and making sure we're aligned kind of at every level of the partnership. And then finally, citywide youth engagement. As I said, youth voice and choice and youth leadership is key core to our model. And so we engage young people citywide in leadership as well. Just a little bit about Minneapolis Beacons in case you're curious. Um, so as Jenny said, we've been in Minneapolis for just over 20 years. We worked last year with over 4,000 young people in kindergarten through 12th grade at 13 schools in Minneapolis. 
91% um, of our participants in Minneapolis are students of color, 84% receive free or reduced lunch. Um, and this is some exciting stuff around our staff. So uh, we have many, as you can see, 19 full-time and 178 part-time staff. But what's exciting is one in five of those staff is a Beacon alum. And 85% of our full-time staff and 75% of our part-time staff are people of color. We intentionally hire folks from our community because this is a community initiative. And so it's really around bringing the community together to create a program and a, and a, a network for, for our whole community. Here's some other cool stuff from our evaluation. So we worked with the Minneapolis Department of Research Evaluation, Accountability, and Assessment. Uh, <laughs> say that. Uh, so, um, and these are, these are two things we found in our most recent longitudinal evaluation with them. Is Beacon participants are more likely to go to attend school. Any way you slice the data, trust me, you will find that in Minneapolis, Beacon participants attend school one week more. You'll find it any way you slice it. Um, and then second, that our participants are more likely to graduate. So you'll see 90% of our high schoolers uh, were on track, were on track to graduate, and 91% graduated, compared to I think 74% was the average in our schools, um, in our Beacon schools. So that's exciting. And then we ask um, about a thousand young people, what did you learn in Beacons this year? And so this is just a little word cloud. And so you'll see young people get a chance to learn, they get a chance to build skills get a chance to explore their world, and they get to think about how they help. And that's something we're really proud of. So I will end there and open for questions. I'm very glad to see all this. I, I feel that our youth have very limited choices uh, after school. Uh, I would like to know about capacity and what the uh, application eligibility and all of those, how does that look like? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so maybe I'll start by just saying, you know, this is going to be a building year for us as we mm -hmm. launch this fall. It will be in partnership. We're working really closely with the lead agency and the principal are working hand in hand right now to determine start dates, capacity and enrollment processes. So some of that is, is still um, being determined, but um, our goal is really to have it be available to all young people that are interested in that school. Um, it, the transportation, of course, is one of the logistics that we'll have to work through in each site. Um, and so I would say more to come, but um, I can say that in some of our Beacon Centers in Minneapolis, we're serving around 200 young people a day after more. school, yeah. um, more in some places. Mm -hmm. So um, as we work through any um, potential barriers to participation, we'll, we expect to see those numbers really climb over the years of the grant. We know we can't start overnight that way, um, but we, we're confident we can build to a really significant capacity. And I'll just add that there are no eligibility requirements. Anyone can participate. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you mentioned that you're uh, very data focused. Um, so, and you shared some data with us about graduation rates and some other data about the demographics. So tell me more about what kind of data you collect and sure. how you know if you're succeeding in your overall goals. Great question. How much time you get? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so we evaluate along a few different lines. I'll start and then you fill in. So um, we measure, we want to know kind of who's coming and how much they're coming, right? So we measure attendance. We measure kind of demographic information. We want to know who our young people are and how often they're attending, right? That's one. Another one is we want to know what it's like for them in our programs. We want to understand program experience. So we use the survey on after school and academic youth outcomes through the National Institute on Out of School Time. It's called SEO for short. Um, and so we do that twice a year. It's a nationally you know, used research validated tool um, to better understand both youth experience as well as their, their outcomes that they experience from the program. Mm -hmm. um, so we use that. Um, in terms of knowing how well we're doing, um, day to day, we use the Youth Program Quality Assessment. Wow, how did I not know that? <laughs> the YPQA. So that's a point of service um, quality assessment tool where we really look at what's happening in that moment in the programs. We use that tool not only to kind of measure where we are at benchmarks, but also as a reflection tool. That's what's cool about it is it's not only you know, again, research validated tool that shows how well you're doing in terms of your day-to-day -day quality, but also it's built to be 
a capacity building tool. And so that's part of the work of the network is to work with folks on building that capacity in that area. Oh, what else? Um, and then, yeah, and then we work with the school district really around thinking around creative ways that we can measure academic outcomes based on the data that the school collects. Um, and we're, we're working with Minneapolis Public Schools right now on doing some qualitative analysis to complement some of what we're finding in the numbers. How can we fill in some of those gaps in the story of like, okay, so Beacon's participants attend school more, why? You know, I'm really trying to fill in some of those gaps that we find in the numbers with stories. So we're working with them on that this year. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. It does. It's, it's very, a very solid answer. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah. I appreciate all that. <laughs> you tell you went to Richfield School, so you're smart. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> I went to Richfield um, Second question, um, as long as I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. Um, so I feel that I personally, as you're kind of sharing um, the program, it's easy for me to visualize how this would work for uh, primary age kids, uh, maybe even in the middle schoolers. Does it look different for a high school age kid? Is Absolutely. that, okay? yeah, yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, so, you know, you look like you were ready. So, yeah, so you'll find with the younger ages, you'll see more, um, more, uh, what's the word, um, structured kind of programming activities, right? Like you're in this cooking club for these days and these things where in high school it gets a little bit looser. Young people are often leading more of their own clubs or young people are inviting in, you know, doing, doing more leadership work in terms of, uh, managing, running, supporting, building program, as well as leading in the community in various ways that they determine are necessary, right? One of the first things I know that they're planning on doing is working with high schoolers to do a citywide needs assessment, for example. And so that's the type of thing that you'll see more in the high school, as well as you'll see obviously career and college readiness work. You'll see, um, you know, there's a lot more kind of support connecting young people to systems, connecting young people to the things that they need. Um, you know, there's efforts happening in Minneapolis around getting young people access to IDs, bank accounts. You know, we're building systems to do that. Right. So it's a little different. You'll still see the, the core programs, but kind of the secondary piece to that is a little bit more around kind of life readiness, preparedness, mm -hmm. and leadership. Yeah, because what I was thinking about is one of our, um, one of our goals mm -hmm. as a school district and at, at Richfield High School is to see more participation in extracurricular activities you know that we're offering um, obviously not only because we believe that that's good for the kids who are participating for their own personal growth and development um, but also fosters really that sense of community mm -hmm. um, and so uh, yeah i guess i'm trying to wrap my head around how those pieces all mm -hmm. kind of intersect and mm -hmm. and become a, a sort of mutually enhancing kind of cycle so yeah, and we know with high school students that they vote with their feet, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. if they're engaged and they want to be there, they have a relationship or they have a role, they have some a reason where they feel being there matters, yeah. then they'll show up. Yeah. And so we believe that when we can find that hook in the out-of-school time, that can also translate into the school day in terms mm -hmm. of the sense of engagement and connection. So it's fun work. And even tying back to your evaluation question, we also do youth participatory yes. evaluation. Sure. So um, and you wouldn't research, think that would yeah. be a young person's hook necessarily, well, but for some yeah. it really is. And we just finished, we just wrapped up with our Beacon National Network, a youth participatory action research project. So teams of young people and adults from all of our Beacon cities just completed a year long research project and came together in San Francisco to present and so we do different stuff like that in the high schools. Cool, thank yeah. you. As, as students um, sign up, register, or get involved, is, are there expectations for regular participation? Is there a schedule that they're expected to keep? Sure. Um, are are drop-ins welcome? Great question. So what we know around program quality, right, and, and outcomes is that young people have greater outcomes for more sustained participation and dosage. And so one of the core things that we do is we, we build offerings basically semester wide semester wise so you'll have you'll sign up for a cooking group and you'll be in cooking mondays and wednesdays at centennial from this date until winter break and then we'll start over again after winter break um and so while there's not a specific always you know a thing where it's like if you didn't come two times you're out more than more than likely what it will be is if you don't show up two times you're going to get a phone call and be like hey what's going on like we missed you yesterday 
Um, Because we really do want to get young people engaged in kind of sustained participation and making sure that they're attending regularly. And then with um, with the program at Centennial, if if there is capacity, are are students from other schools expected to be allowed to participate? Mm Yeah, yeah, so yes. If if they can get there, I assume. Correct, right, and if we can do that in a safe way, right? So if program begins at 3 o'clock and then somebody is showing up at 3.22, um, if there's a way we can navigate that in a way that's safe for young people, then absolutely we can do that. Um, And the other thing we've talked about is looking at how it goes in our three schools and discussing the possibility of applying for a second grant for the other three elementary schools, Um, but we really want to start out it was important for Beacons and the partnership to start at all three levels. Mm-hmm. Um, and with Centennial being our higher poverty school, we felt it was important to the core mission of all of us um, to, for them to begin there. Um, there's also a smaller um, extended day program at Centennial. And so more offerings at Centennial were absolutely a, a point of need for us. Um, I One of the things I was gonna ask about was you mentioned at the beginning, just you know, trying to do work to understand what are our local needs. And so I'm so excited that you then talked about our high school students being a part of that and actually hopefully really leading that. And I'm just so eager to hear um, what we learn and then how we respond. And so I guess the, the other thing that I am just really eager to hear more about is how and when are we gonna be able to share this so that people have a sense of you know, yes, there are a lot of things that are still being determined because this is happening very quickly. But, um, you know, even just over the weekend, there was a very large thread on our very active community Facebook page. You saw it (laughs) Um, about the need for a community center. And, you know, I made one little comment about how we were getting information about this and somebody responded right away. I'm so excited to learn more. You know, how could I learn more? So I'd, I'd just love to hear from you all or from our team as appropriate, just what thoughts and plans are around um, that part of this. So we work together on a communication plan um, with our communications team and their communications team. Um, they actually have drafted press releases um, and they're working together on it. Um, the goal is to send that off to media on Friday um, and then also send that out to staff and teachers on Friday of this week when our teachers return. Um, and then on Monday of next week, um, really updating that to the school website, um, blasting that out to all of our families, and then really getting some excitement around social media. So we are now at the place where this was the time to present to the board. Um, Friday, we anticipate press releases going out and broad-based communication occurring Monday the 26th. One additional question, and this this is actually more um, directed to our admin. Obviously, follow-up is something that you guys are very good at, and uh, we. Um, but we have to remind each other to stay on top of it sometimes. What is our follow-up plan for reporting back on the Beacons program? Um, we're looking at most likely somewhere around January, February. I'm okay. um, looking at a progress update um, so we can come back to the board and talk about how did launch go, where do we stand in this program, um, and how are things looking. And obviously, that's also the time where we begin budgeting and planning for next year. Um, and so we'll be doing that. Um, we'll be doing that work as we come back. Um, and, and so Mary's catching in the notes, January, February. Thank you, thank you. And Mary, one more piece. This is uh, uh, my my request. I would really love to be getting, um, as part of that report, uh, uh, granular data from the uh, SAO and some of these sure. research validated tools yeah, no that Haley was mentioning. I got that right, Haley. Yeah, you did. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And actually, yeah, depending, yeah. we can talk offline. We, I can, yeah. we can nerd out about this because I have oh, yeah, some no, more I'm opportunities, different ways you can plug in if you're interested. Yeah. And yeah. just for clarification on that, because I'm doubting we will have that data about our programs. Are you asking me about that specific level of information on Minneapolis, or are you saying you'd like that? No, from we will have some. We'll have field. some. So I, I think, okay. I guess that what I'm really driving at is um, I think that we will have our best outcome as a collaborative group when we have um, sort of full access to all that data and that we're um, able to, as board members, um, get into the weeds um, if we need to. Um, And I'm just kind of putting that request out proactively so that you guys are prepared. Sounds good. We will come with data January, February with what we have, without a doubt. Thank you so much. Great. We're so excited. Thank you.
All right, so next on the docket, um, I'm bringing up uh, Mr. Holgey and Mr. Kretzinger. Um, as the board had requested, um, facilities update about our recycling, tree planting, environmental impact, and some of the things we're doing with relation to sustainability. Um, and so with that, I'm just going to turn things over to Craig and Dan. Yep. So I'll just do a quick introduction. Since Dan started in Richfield, he's been talking about green practices and how do we improve some of our environmental work and make sure that we're um, being responsible stewards of our community. And so he's been actively pursuing a lot of grants and a lot, a lot of opportunities that provide some resources for us to do this, um, as well as a lot of legwork. Um, there are a few just things to highlight um, as far as some of this. So some of it is finding resources. Some of it is training. And then the other thing that I'm really excited about the programming that we've done is it's engaging kids in this work um, and having them become leaders in much of this work as well. So those are some of the things that you'll hear Dan talk about here. I'm gonna let him um, shout from the mountaintops <laughs> the information that he has because it's some exciting stuff, knowing that this is also a work in progress in progress, and we will keep moving forward in this area as well. So let's turn it over to Dan. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. It's very kind. The hard part about this is following up such an exciting presentation. I'm a little nervous now. <laughs> so um, we're just going to talk a little bit about an update on our um, recycling grant, um, our tree planting update, as well as some environmental impact information for you um, as we go here. So, um, so when we um, first applied for the Hennepin County recycling grant, um, we developed this overview and it uh, provided some goals and an objective of what we were looking for behind getting, uh, receiving the grant money for this project. So um, as you can see, our biggest goal, or our, our uh, project goal was to reduce waste that's going into our landfills and be able to take our recycling and our, our um, organics and, and separate that out so it doesn't reach our landfills. Um, through that, um, through the money that we would collect um, or receive from the grants um, was purchasing some new receptacles um, and uh, equipment and uh, also um, educate our students as well on, on what to do and how to do uh, recycling in our district. So. I also would say too that um, this also tied nicely into our um, strategic plan 4D, which says um, train staff on composting, recycling, energy efficient procedures, and provide signage in targeted areas. And I think we covered most of those things in this. So as part of the update, um, Hennepin County provided us with a $50,000 grant as well, um, we also needed to provide a $12,000 um, match to that. Um, and, and due to some of the uh, Hennepin, due to input from Hennepin County, and um, we made some changes to that plan on what things we we're gonna purchase and, and do with that money. So final purchases um, were made this spring. It was a year and a half project roughly. Um, the high school, Sorting stations that we're going to be receiving are actually going to be built in. Um, so we're going to be waiting for that to come to fruition once construction is done. Um, and then during the last week of school, um, we um, generated um, 64 to 85% of that waste that we generated that was diverted um, from the, the landfill or trash stream. So that was exciting. Um, sorting tables were delivered in May and that really limited our evaluation time on, on how that was, was working out. We're gonna continue to monitor that through um, weighing our trash and recyclables and our composting as well. It was kind of fun too, we got to work with students on this. Um, we met with um, Mr. Braun's class um, several times. They, they called, coined themselves the green team. Um, and they assisted on, on uh, uh, training the kids at the, at the schools and they were reaching in with these big tongs into the trash cans and moving things around so that they could educate those students on proper ways to do this. Um, our, and, and it was a team effort too. I mean, it, it, food service, um, Pam Hop played a, a huge role in that as well. She even made these cool shirts that I think Corey's gonna hold up here for us for the green team and on the back it, it also um, says we can make a difference in the world so 
So a lot of fun. Um, and uh, school administration did an excellent job also. Um, we, we improved our signage so that um, in labeling, you'll see a picture of that here on the upcoming slide. This is what we had um, previously. Um, you can see the centennial on the left and STEM on the right. It was just difficult to, to, for kids to actually sort these things out. So, so what we've invested in is these new uh, sorting tables. You can see the everything is now color coded, so kids can see it from a distance. They know what their what their task is. Um, they walk up to a table, they pour their milk into a bucket, and then they can set their tray on the counter and place um, their items in the appropriate uh, receptacles. And you can see they have some um, areas there that show specifically what items go into what uh, location. So part of this as well, we added um, trash and recycling bins in all of our green spaces. Uh, and we've seen, like I said, a 40% reduction in the amount of trash that, um, uh, that otherwise would have gone into the landfill. So I'm trying to catch up to my slides. You were so sorry, you were so smooth with the receptacles. <laughs> So moving on from there, um, this is talking about our um, healthy tree and canopy grant that we applied for uh, back in 27, or actually last year, um, but back in 2017, um, per city, for the city's recommendations and our arborist, um, we ended up removing 30 trees um, from our grounds due to progressed emerald ash borer and infestation and just normal die off from, from other issues. So aside from the grant, um, the remaining 90 or so trees were or have been treated so far for emerald ash borer. Um, and then also the, the tree grant also allows us to restore the number of trees that we've removed um, with a diverse and a strategically selected assortment of trees. Um, there are from working with the arborist, I found out that there are a lot of new diseases and new bug strains that are coming out that could wipe out for us. Um, so we want to do our best to mitigate that. So overall, um, 14 trees were planted this spring. We had three at the high school, two at Central, five at Centennial, and four at Sheridan Hills. Another 19 trees will be planted this fall at STEM, RDLS, the high school, and middle school, um, depending on construction. So we, we don't want to get in the way of that. But um, our uh, Hennepin County forester, Dustin Ellis, was on site to instruct students on the proper ways and techniques to planting trees and the importance of the important role that trees have in our environment and how that uh, works in our ecosystem. Um, the tree planting project was offered to teachers as a learning opportunity for students of all grades. It was fun that uh, uh, Brandon, Brandon Shaw's class is able to participate in the planting with us. In the next slide, you'll see the students helping out um, with planting, and it was fun that they, they had some instructional time with our forester. Then moving on from that to um, lawn cure and weed control. So when I first started here, we would receive calls and things with, with um, uh, asking about our dandelions that we had in the district, a lot, of, a lot of yellow. So we started working on that. And there is a fine balance between aesthetics, efficiency, envi and environmental concerns. And we're working really hard to maintain that, that balance. Um, and for example, um, True Green is our current provider for um, uh, fertilization and weed control. Five applications are recommended by them. We're actually using their minimum amount, which is three applications. And that said, we're seeing great results. So um, we're doing a, a spring pre-emergent, a summer fertilizer, and then a fall winter prep. <clears throat> the weed control is also applied in spot locations, so we're not just walking around and spraying the entire yard. Um, we're, we're 
trying to be strategic in that. That helps us to save money, it's better for the environment, and it also helps to promote thick and healthy grass, which also reduces the amount of, of spraying that we need to do. It kind of chokes out the ability for the weeds to grow. Um, True Gain uses state-of-the-art equipment. You can see that there um, in their riding machine. They can, they can spray fertilizer and um, weed control at the same time. Um, and this promotes, again, healthy turf. It's safety for our fields and for our students on them. So our fence lines are treated annually with the vegetation sterilant that reduces the need for weed whipping and in turn reduces our labor costs. We're trying some new options as well. You can see at Sheridan Hills, we've, we've, uh, when we replaced the fencing there, we uh, went with a, a, a weed blocker so that we don't have to, we don't have to uh, uh, weed whip or use that spray at all. We can ride that with the mower and, and do the same thing. Um, moving on to snow and ice removal. Um, we have two staff members that are currently certified um, in smart salting, which is a, which is a, a certification that Hennepin County puts on as well, um, teaching about ways to um, better ensure that we're protecting the environment and our salting practices. <clears throat> we're working um, also with our head custodians on, on those classes as well when they become available. Um, there's, there's a balance there as well. Um, there's, we need to maintain our safety for our staff and we don't want slips and falls. It's a, it's a huge expense and, it's, and it takes our employees out of the workforce and um, our staff and our kids as well from school. So we wanna make sure that we're maintaining those things. Our environmental concerns as well is very important to us. Um, part of those priorities too are reducing the contaminations of lakes, rivers, and groundwater. Um, and using uh, proper equipment that will also help to do that, which scrapes and gets down to the surface, so we don't have to use so much salt. And the other issue that, um, that also is a big concern uh, for Hennepin County is salt storage. Thankfully here in our district, we don't have to, we don't have to hold bulk, bulk salt because we have a great partnership with our city and we're able to uh, receive that from them. And then our bag salt, um, that's stored indoors and out of the rain and elements so that we don't have leaching issues with that either. So with all of that, <laughs> any questions? Those three trees you planted at the high school, did they survive the construction? They did. <laughs> yep, there, we actually had to move them out of the way so that we could, uh, we could we're, we'll plant three where they're supposed to here after that work is done. All those ash trees you're treating, mm. is there any statistic on the survival rate of trees treated? That's a great question. Um, I know that it's higher. Um, there's, the, the treatment lasts three years. It's a guaranteed um, application. And so they'll, they'll guarantee that work. So if we have issues, they'll continue to treat it if, if the vegetation starts to die. <clears throat> up on top, they'll continue to treat it. So every three years we do this, as soon as the, the spread of the bug moves across the country, they say that we can reduce our number of applications because there won't be that, the material here for the bugs to eat. So I'm really excited uh, about this information you're presenting. I've been um, kind of, um, asking for you know this kind of report and and, a, and obviously we've had some community partners come in and ask and so i'm really excited to hear um, about the work that you're doing um my question is is your sense that where where do you feel that we are with this work in other words do you feel that this is work that you're able to do systemically and sort of systematically that it is embedded in basically your sort of the base practices of your department, or do you feel like this is still one of those things where we're doing add-ons here, add-ons there, and we have opportunities to um, maybe make it more systemic? You know, I think, I think we can always do better. 
I think there's always room for growth and there's new things coming out. <clears throat> More information on how we can better um, take care of our environment and those types of things um, and, and better equipment and processes for that. So I think we're, we're I wouldn't say early stages, but I think we're midway into it. And I yeah. think there's still some more room that we can we can do as we go forward. So I guess that my um, my own personal feeling um, in terms of even feeling very excited and enthusiastic about the work that you're sharing. Um, I mean, I think to see what you guys have done with the recycling work, for example, um, to me that exemplifies um, you know, a bit of a gold standard for where we should be aiming to be with kind of all of our work in that. Um, obviously, what we see with the, with the new sorting tables looks like sort of state of the art um, uh, facility for t not only teaching our kids about um, sustainable waste management practices, getting our sort of, you know, something that can be systematized throughout the district. We can measure how well we're doing. So again, to me, that meets certainly a high level, high level of standard for what we should be aiming for. Um, and then we can also be keeping track of that over time. Um, again, this is my um, desire to see that data, you know, so we can see not only where we have room to improve, but how we, you know, we know where, where, where we're being successful and we know maybe when we need to focus our efforts more on a particular area. I would love to see that same, um, standard if I see us be able to apply that same standard across the board to a number of the other areas that we've highlighted so you've highlighted stuff with um, you know for sort of our grounds practices with the turf um, with our salting um, with you know enhancing biodiversity in terms of the plantings that we have in our uh, sort of in our acreage um, and I feel that it would be helpful as a tool for you guys um, and also as a tool for us as a district, if we had a policy um, that was around sustainability. Um, so I guess that would be something I'd be very interested in um, asking the administration to do some work to try and craft a sustainability policy um, that would be oriented both at how we're managing buildings, how we're managing our grounds, um, and also how we're then, uh, I mean, this might not be part of the policy, but um, how we sort of engage our students in that work as sort of becoming part and parcel of sort of the daily work of um, Bishop Public Schools. So um, that's something that I, I have had a chance to share with, I don't know, Dan, if you had a chance to see it, but I did change share with administration um, some sustainability policies that other academic institutions are using. I haven't found any in K-12 yet. Um, most of these are higher learning, um, and so it might actually be another place where we can lead. Um, but I would love to see, I would love to see the administration take that on and um, this, I think this could be a win-win. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's something for us to certainly look at and look to, to see what to develop next. We do have a policy talking about how we, how we deal with goods. Um, and I think it is definitely something that is in our, um, in our work to really examine and really deepen quite significantly. So something we can absolutely look at at guidance of the board to see what would be those next sustainability pieces. And you did provide a set of, um, models from other organizations that we can definitely look at as we look to examine how to how to deepen add on and, and create a deeper policy around this work yeah and, and again as we've had this conversation um, kind of unfolding over the last several months um, i think there will be multiple opportunities for us to work together with the city um, to have areas where we have shared interests and where we can maybe even pool our resources um, to work together um, to develop what those best practices need to look like um, and I'd love to see as we, yeah, as we work on developing that policy, I would love to see uh, engagement of the broader community, um, especially our students, um, in terms of um, actually developing what that policy would look like. Because these are the people who will be living with these results for the longest. So I think they have a big stake in it. Absolutely. For those interested, uh, energy management conservation is 804 with guidelines 804.1, um, and definitely they are there, um, but certainly, and as Mr. Kretzinger pointed out within our strategic plan, and definitely something that we can examine at the discretion of the board and, and look at bolstering and adding to those pieces. Thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm. I, 
Yeah. You're not done yet. Okay. <laughs> um, so just one comment and then one question. And the comment is just to echo, I really appreciate being able to get a more holistic view on the work that you and your team have been doing already. Um, and specifically, I just, I love the three objectives that were on that first slide. And I think those are the types of things that we should continue to be striving for. I know it was specific to the recycling grant that we received, but I think big picture, it helps us chart a direction and you know that it says creating an eco-conscious culture throughout the district. I think that's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, so the question is specifically about composting, mm -hmm. um, because I know that there are requirements that are being implemented now at a county level. And so I'm curious if our practices currently, especially with those new sorting bins, because I know one of those is for organics, um, are we at the point where we are ready to be in compliance or is there work that we are still doing? And I know the city is working on this right now as well to actually get in compliance with those new composting requirements. Yeah, that's a great question. And to answer that, um, yes, we, we are in compliance currently. Um, and it's, it's actually not intended for K-12 schools. It's more intended for the higher education side and then also for businesses that produce more waste than you know, a smaller business would, for instance. Um, I believe it's gonna come to K-12, so we're trying to be proactive and be ready for that as it comes. Um, right now, the only place that we're behind in, I think, is, is that uh, maybe not behind in, but um, waiting for construction to be done at the high school so that that can be accomplished at the high school, but the other buildings we are in compliance on. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thank you. The, the only other piece um, that I wanted to reflect on is, um, and this may be partially a question, partially a comment, but um, obviously it's fabulous when we have the ability to access grants to fund some of this work. Um, however, the goal is that, um, you know, whether it's recycling or planting trees, the goal is that that is work that we can sustain. You know, we're talking about sustainability. So we need to be able to fund that through our usual operation expense. We can't, we can't just simply be relying upon grants to fund this work long, long term. Um, so I guess I would just sort of challenge um, the team to look at where we're expending money now on practices that maybe aren't fully aligned with, with sustainability, our sustainability vision. You know, once we have a policy and a vision developed, this might become easier. Uh, but we, at least theoretically, the thought would be that there may be opportunities for savings. We maybe can reduce expenses in some places. We can maybe shift dollars that we're investing in practices that are a little bit less sustainable into those that are more sustainable, um, because obviously we ultimately need this to be a um, fixed part of our operations. You know that that will that won't require um, external funding in order to be maintained. So, and I think to that point, one of the things you'll find is the grants are used for one-time purchases. So that's, that's equipment, trees, things like that that are producing. I think the other thing that um, has happened in Richfield, and we've done a nice job of building in the education component. Imagine that we're an education organization, so that education of students, that education of our staff on these practices is a critical piece in that in many of these situations is what builds that sustainability, as well as to your point of making sure that how we're aligning resources is in the best advantage for our total operations of an organization. All right, we're gonna continue on with the superintendent report. <laughs> um, so we're calling up um, Mr. Corey Plank to have a conversation around instructional technology, um, review some of the work that we did last year, um, and then take a look at some of our priorities as we move forward into 1920. Thank you, Dr. Yanowski. Uh, good evening. Um, Thank you, I should have, should have paused for wait time there. Uh, okay, so I wanted to brief uh, tonight and, and requested a briefing to just update on strategic objectives uh, and how we met those. Uh, the health of our technology levy, uh, students, staff, and voice in the process, and then vision and priorities for the upcoming year and beyond. Um, first of all, in terms of strategic objectives, as you know, we're coming to the end of a strategic plan. Uh, and so I wanted to brief really on where, we, uh, where we've uh, arrived at this point. So, um, Steve, thank you. Um, 
Increased access. So in, within the strategic plan um, and strategy for HI, we wanted to provide increased mobile device access for students and increased mobile device access for staff. And again, the emphasis here being on mobile, um, we had a significant amount of fixed assets, fixed labs, uh, and we wanted to really make sure that that was mobile and start moving uh, towards a more mobile environment so that we could become more flexible and nimble. Um, so we wanted to move to, and the tech steering committee had a strong voice in going to two to one in grades K through five. And again, as a reminder, that's one device, uh, or uh, two students, one device. So about uh, just a little bit more than half of the class, and that happened by way of um, mobile labs. And one to one in grades six through 12. And those, uh, the common platform are Chromebooks, a Google product. Uh, provide increased mobile device uh, access for staff. Nearly all staff have mobile laptops, and we're going to be moving in our next generation to make sure that all staff uh, have mobile, access, uh, mobile laptops. And next generation, two-in-one laptops are being tested in 1920 for future phasing. What I mean by next generation two-in-one laptops are laptops that have increased functionality, that they can rotate around and become a tablet, they can be st they're stylus enabled, and teachers then can use them as a slate, as a way in which to um, replace uh, smart boards in some levels, well, we'll keep the smart boards in place at the elementary level, okay? Um, and I can answer questions on that, uh, and I have briefed the tech steering committee on that as well. Um, uh, excuse me, the uh, district technology advisory committee, sorry if I uh, conflated those. Uh, equitable access, uh, provides support opportunities for family with limited technology access, and so what we're trying to do here are two-in-one and one-in-one distribution that was focused on equitable access and support. Again, putting resources uh, where we needed to do so in order to have equitable access, and I want to come back to that in a second, and I will, but uh, mobile hotspots for students needing internet access is one example of that. So uh, we have the ability to be able to uh, check out hotspots through uh, Verizon, uh, filtered Verizon access for families that need that. We're working this year on uh, improving our processes and our policies around that. One thing, for example, anecdotally that we learned last year was a daily checkout is a, it, uh, was something that was a deterrent for our, our uh, kids. And, and basically meaning, if I have to go to the library daily and check that out, I'm gonna find other means by which to get online. And so we're looking at that and then also ways in which we can de decrease stigma. So people don't have to go to a library and go, can I have a hotspot? And then everyone knows I don't have internet. What are ways in which we can get um, hotspots to people where it's uh, less stigmatized? Um, and uh, innovation, or found, our foundation for innovation, developing and implementing K-12 digital media and curriculum standards. And we're, uh, our media specialists have been incredible in this, and I look forward to publishing the final draft of those uh, this year. And then implementing standard technology resources K-12. And we really standardize around Google Chromebooks for our students and uh, Windows 10 for our staff. And we'll be all the way on Windows 10 uh, by January of this upcoming year. Um, so I'm excited about that as well. Uh, technology levy updates. So overall, fiscal health of our technology level. A couple things here I wanted to highlight. One is just our carryover balance. So our technology levy now is coming into its fifth year, uh, and the prior levy balance, or the balance carried forward in June of this past year, was a positive or a net 203,000. Uh, it's actually 203,855. Um, the 2018-19 levy expenditures were uh, $2.9 million, whereas we brought in uh, three, uh, just over $3 million. And then the fiscal year 19 balance forward then from that is roughly $60,000. that is carried over into uh, a surplus now of $263,855. So that's that half, and the key there is, is the fiscal health, that it is solvent and it's beyond solvent and we have a little bit of a cushion there. Um, and one of the things I wanted to highlight for both, uh, um, one thing that's, that's important to note is I'm, uh, when we look at the way in which we're spending money within the technology levy, levy uh, one of the things that I put pressure on myself uh, with and, and that I wanna use the technology advisory committee for are, uh, having conversations about the allocation percentage and how and what and what that says about how we're utilizing the money and what we value in technology um, integration. And so, as we look at that, um, one of the areas I want to highlight is it's a very large slice that we have on leases and rentals. One of the key things to understand there is we're coming to the end of our infrastructure lease, which was a very large buy to uh, retrofit our buildings for internet access, high-speed internet access. 
And so that process, the labor, the hardware, et cetera, to make that happen was a very large buy. And so that was a lease cycle. This coming year will be the last year of the lease payment. Um, and that is a significant chunk of that. And there is an attached spreadsheet that's in the board minutes that lays that out. And I would say that uh, six sevenths or more of that is that large balloon payment, okay? Um, that comes to an end this year, all right? And so that's gonna be a great opportunity for DTAC conversations too about how we value our expenditure within the tech levy going forward, how we prepare for uh, uh, future um, conversations around um, continuing the technology levy as well. And then you, uh, within those pieces as well, you can see that um, one area that I'd like to highlight is an area that I look to, to expand and continue to evaluate is the professional development piece. Uh, which is not a, a, a significant chunk of that, whereas it's something that we, we put a great deal of effort and energy behind. Um, but it's a great opportunity for conversations about, you know, is that a, a, a significant enough chunk of that uh, slice and training our staff and our students and beyond. Okay, um, okay you can go to the next one. Um, and then our monetary impact of the one to one and two to one going forward. Okay, so uh, one of the things here that was exciting to look at were our numbers uh, for this year in terms of, you know, when a device, we switched from devices being in fixed labs and never leaving the school. And we went to an environment, you know, uh, a wild, wild west environment, I guess, where, where the, the devices are going home every night, okay? And they're going home with adolescents through uh, adults, all right? So our, our seniors are uh, in that adult range. And so we all know, um, that adolescents and teenagers and et cetera can be hard on, uh, on hardware or any kind of uh, item. Uh, and so what was, what was really exciting to see was how wonderful our uh, students were with our technology, okay? And this, so going into this year, I budgeted for about a 10% loss. And that comes from previous experience, research on one-to-one -one programs, really knowing that you, uh, 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 network of uh, surrounding tech uh, directors and talking to them as well and what to budget for. And that 10% uh, plan loss, we came in well underneath that. Okay, and what we mean by loss, of course, then are devices that aren't returned and then damage beyond repair. Okay, so a damage beyond repair device then will come back, but it's, it's basically the cost of fixing it exceeds the, the value or what it's worth, basically a total load cost. Um, and so, when we uh, put those numbers together, we came uh, uh, in at about a 3.9% loss, uh, which, came, which was also uh, something that was exciting to see in the fact that we, um, going forward, continue, can continue to maintain equitable access. And I'll brief you a little bit more on, on what I mean by that, and also not put undue additional burden, financial burden on our families, okay? So if you slide forward on that, Dr. Yanowski. Uh, student and staff voice, I'll come back with my thought there in just a second, but a couple comments uh, that came out of staff. We surveyed staff and students this year after year one. I uh, got some quality feedback. One of the things was talking about providing students uh, in the arts uh, with more access to technology. One of the blind spots going into this was um, we have this two to one access in classrooms. How do we get those two to one sets into music and art and, and et cetera so that they can be used within the arts, whereas they're nested in uh, uh, core classrooms right now, or homerooms. Um, thank you for uh, IT help desk responsiveness. We worked really hard at uh, making sure that we had increased ticket response time this year and, and uh, yielded some qual uh, quality results there. Make sure to include technology setups and new classroom designs. As we build new um, classroom spaces, we wanna make sure that that technology we're putting in there is not only new, but uh, responsive to the idea that we want flexible learning environments. Um, please continue to provide more district level professional development with technology. There's a huge emphasis behind this this year. Um, and so when we, uh, our, techno our uh, in uh, workshop days, as well as our back to school workshop, there's a heavy amount of technology professional development. Um, and so I'm excited about that as well. And thank you for the plan and to update our smart boards. Our K through our, excuse me, our early childhood through fifth grade and then special ed uh, beyond that smart boards will be updated in, the, in a three year cycle. And so they're going from uh, the traditional uh, touch the screen with a projector up here to very similar to this model right here where it's interactive and touch screen. Um, and you can plug things into it and when, in some ways it's like a TV, in other ways it's like a smart board. Um, and what did students say? Some fun things here, one of my favorite here that I pulled out of there. Thanks for the Chromebooks, they were a good idea. 
loosen the rules of the technology uh, use a little bit and chill. Um, we need better, more consistent phone usage policy. Uh, again, a wonderful piece of feedback there, right there. And, and kids do experience very different fr from class to class and from school to school, very different phone um, uh, usage policies. Uh, and then while Chromebooks can cause distractions sometimes, and again, just a wonderful uh, bit of understanding there, um, I believe that the positives outweigh the negatives, and I'm glad that we have a chance to see them, uh, or to use them and enhance our learning. And one of the things there is really being conscious of that student voice in their understanding of the positives and the negatives. Um, okay, and then just a couple of uh, final things. One of the things is um, from infrastructure build up to 21st century classrooms, so that monetary transition. One of the things is being conscious of, you know, all right, now we'll have a significant more chunk available of, of, of finances due to a lease payment that's ending. How do we make sure that we're using, or that we're being conscious of future uh, planning for the future so that we don't have to go uh, into lease cycles. Um, two and one and one one for three more years and then we'll reevaluate. So we're on a three year uh, cycle now where we'll have this model in place and then two and a half years from now, two years from now, we'll start to have conversations about what the three years look like from now um, in terms of what's next. And so we want to be nimble there. Gig speed internet access, so again, continue to make sure that we have um, uh, ubiquitous high speed internet access. Staff technology support and digital learning coach and professional development support. So um, adding a digital learning coach, uh, having Ken Friel on board in that position who has wonderful relationships within the district is really exciting for this year as well. And then we wanna make sure that we build flexible classroom technology standards. So again, what I mean by that is the technology that's in the classroom that it's standardized, that we have professional development around that, and that we also uh, are be being conscious of it being flexible, okay? Um, you know, our, our students are moving, our staff is moving. We're transitioning not only from a classroom space out into a flexible space, but then back again, and our spaces become more fluid within our schools. And so being uh, conscious of planning for that. And differentiating and personalizing curriculum with supportive technology. That move from, and I believe strongly in, we first have to learn to differentiate with technology to be able to move on to personalizing with technology. And, and I'm excited about um, some of the conversations we're having uh, about laying the groundwork for that. Um, and then finally, uh, future-facing infrastructure and cybersecurity structures, practices, and policies. Very excited to dig into not only um, what we're doing in terms of cyber cybersecurity and being future-facing with that, but also looking at board policy to make sure that it's where it needs to be uh, going forward um, on having a secure environment. And everybody here has read uh, the horror stories of not having secure environments, okay? And then finally, radical hospitality. One thing I want to just insert in here real quick about this radical hospitality, there, are, there will be no more, there won't be fees, again, uh, going forward for families to have access to Chromebooks. The fee is the technology levy. So families have access to uh, Chromebooks as part of this plan. Um, they do have a, 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 stru a structure that they enter into when they sign the Chromebook user agreement that says after a, um, a second break, they have a very small fine that they pay for that, which is greatly subsidized. So um, that can be found on the website uh, under digital uh, or under our technology um, realm. Uh, um, redesigned IT space with support for staff and students, really public facing uh, help desk presence in our new IT space. Very excited about that. Redesigned media centers with support for students, oftentimes by students. So also excited about that, student technology support teams. Um, and branding those student technology support teams and get them out there and doing our, uh, helping us do our customer service. Um, anytime, anywhere, learning opportunities for students, staff, and eventually parents through Schoology. Had a wonderful conversation today with Teresa Rosen who's finishing the schedule of the high school. Okay, one of the things about that's a challenge of the schedule is the end of the day, there's very few, there's, it's difficult to find time for prep and the class sizes are big, okay? It's one of those areas where you're gonna begin to have conversations about flexible learning environments and blended learning, both in the class and out of the class and what could be accomplished, you know, um, in a blended learning environment to ease our, our uh, number of kids and seats in classrooms. So really excited about uh, beginning to have those conversations about anytime, anywhere learning. And we onboarded uh, a new learning management system called Schoology that our high school will begin using this year, widely used in Minnesota and the metro area, and excited about that going forward. And then redesign portal, 
um, and really looking at that portal and continue to make improvements on that. We've already decreased now down to um, only one portal icon left where you have to do a dual login. We call it a single sign-in and there were a lot of them you had to do a dual sign-in. So I'm really conscious of trying to get us to a point at which we have that true single sign-on secure experience. So with that, um, I'm, uh, we would love to take questions. Guys, just to, to clarify, you yeah. said um, the so the original build in, the, you know, the, the the massive project to update the the infrastructure that yeah. would allow the the expansion of technology. We're on our last year of payments for that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that will that theoretically should free up quick math up six hundred thousand dollars. Did you say? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that that's that's a bit new, more north of that. A little bit. Oh, yeah. Yep. But but new opportunity for yep. to be deployed for other purposes along these lines. So that, I mean. I suppose I, I'm wondering if you combine that with the the very encouraging loss and damage rate, yeah. are there opportunities to expand summer use and, and and to have summer enrichment opportunities and expansion of programs like that where 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 you could have kids with with um, sort of slightly structured but not as structured as traditional summer school where they where we could push out programs that would keep them engaged in throughout the summer if if they chose. Yes, the answer is yes, uh, absolutely. There are a couple pieces there that are actually um, exciting to consider. One of the things is the human capital and financial investment in bringing the devices in at the end of an academic year and then issuing them back out again. Um, so that just logistically, uh, in terms of maintaining a device and holding onto a device uh, over the summer and then pushing out program or providing programming for families to be able to uh, experience digital learning in not just a screen time, but also in, you know, uh, going out and, and doing, you know, I've seen such things as doing scavenger hunts in the community and reporting them back to a digital learning platform. Um, and so having opportunities for learning and digital learning and blended learning over the summer, absolutely. I think there's there's definitely room within that to have that conversation for a relatively minimal cost. You, you know, of course, loss and breakage rates would go up, um, but yes. Yep. One of the things I did want to mention, by the way, is we're putting, uh, ex with the exception of seventh and eighth grade, which are on very, uh, they're the oldest of our Chromebooks, all the other Chromebooks this year are getting universally snap on cases for additional protection as well. So um, just to help in terms of those damage numbers. So. I just wanted to point out so when you talked about leases and rentals and then mm -hmm. and this lease and the, all of the infrastructure work that went in, mm -hmm. that we, the board as a group, when that first came to us and we first had that technology level, um, the rollout was gonna see some of the schools not get their infrastructure corrected for like five years. And so that was the reason why we all yeah. agreed that it was worth paying interest and doing all of that so that all of the buildings would have that happen for them in one summer. So yeah. it was a good decision and it's nice that we're getting to the end of paying for it. Yeah, it's very, just as a reminder, a very low interest rate too. Yes. Yeah, it was extremely <laughs> yeah. low interest. Correct. Rate. I think at the time there was a lot of board discussion about trying to get away from the lease cycle. Yeah, sure. Because um, we had a lot of things. We, we had a, a million things that, that seemed, but it, it was a way to, for, for due to budgetary constraints, it was you know a requirement, and we, we understood that. But this was one that was even amidst that 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 mindset of can we get away from this lease cycling. Um, the opportunity to do that project as quickly as possible was was really too too much too too much good to pass up. Yeah, and we're really just being conscious of that, and making sure we're matching as in our new improved spaces, matching that infrastructure um, build out as well. And yeah, I, I, and again, it's not to demonize, of course, the lease cycle, and I appreciate that. It's it's really just that we have the opportunity to be able to meet our uh, goals and objectives uh, within a purchasing cycle uh, going forward. I am um, kind of thinking about um, where we started with our Beacons presentation. And so I don't know, Haley, if you want to, you're welcome to pop up and answer this or Corey, if you know the answer, if we just need to talk more about it. But, um, you know, is our technology and these things that we're talking about available and accessible for the programs that are going to be happening in our buildings after school? Well, I would just say just a mirror forward, yeah, we have an after school program where we do make technology available and I'm very willing to partner with that as well. So we absolutely would like to. Um, I would love to do that in a conscientious way that is that is um, 
uh, responsible in terms of that active passive screen time piece too as well you know um, and that's an exciting thing to, to have a conversation about overall but we definitely will make resources available uh, to that program should you want to use them so definitely yeah. in addition to that I will add that um, Sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, in addition to that, I will add that with the expanded day programming and um, traditional school programming, we try as much as possible to make sure that it's a smooth program for students. So similar rules and expectations. It doesn't look the same, but for the experience of the young people that they have access and exposure and um, and so it doesn't feel like, well, this is what we do in mm -hmm. Beacons, and this is what we do during traditional school, because yes. we want the, exp the experience to be um, high standards, high expectations for the entire day. I so appreciate that you got up to say that into the microphone so it was captured. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and one thing I'll just close on as well, um, or of course, if, if there are more, more questions, I did want to just mention too, uh, a continual emphasis around program, program specific technology as well, um, in, in, which includes increasing makerspace, robotics, coding, et cetera, mm -hmm. opportunities for our elementaries all the way up through our high schools. And so we have a, a small or a fairly sizable um, investment in that this year to provide some standardized uh, robotics and, and coding tools at our elementary uh, to get into our new maker spaces and our new libraries. So media centers, excuse me. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Carter. You bet. Thank you. Update. Thanks. Great. Uh, we have no commendations this evening. So that includes our non action items section of the agenda. And we will move next into the approval of the consent agenda containing routine business items. Um, if there is an item that someone would like to remove for independent consideration, um, please note that now. Otherwise, we could have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. I'll move the consent agenda as presented. <laughs> second. So we have a motion by Mr. Paulus and a second by Ms. Malik. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye and the consent agenda is approved. We have just one item of old business before us this evening, a second read of existing board policy 608 on education of students with disabilities. So Superintendent Yunowski, am I right to assume that you are gonna present this? I am gonna present this, okay. yes. And we are um, suggesting possible passage um, as we look at 608. Really the only substantial change was in wording. Um, it had been worded using previous language, uh, disabled students. Um, and the multiple locations in here, those are sit around to the appropriate students with disabilities. Um, and so this is before you. Um, it is obviously a short policy. Um, and so I have this back with the changes in relation to students with disabilities. Thank you. If there are no questions, we could entertain a motion to approve the revisions to board policy 608. Seems like a fairly straightforward <laughs> set of revisions. I will move the policy as revised. I'll say it. So we have a motion by Mr. Tensing and a second by Mr. Ashmead. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye and the policy is approved. Uh, so we have a number of new business items before us for the first time. First is board policy 522 on commencement participation. Yes, we have brought back 522 off cycle. Um, as a reminder, we passed this in May 1st, 2017. A couple of things have happened since then. Um, this year, we are preparing a district-wide training on policies, many of which um, will impact the way we do our business. And so we are also wanting to make sure that we're following the, the board's guidance, that we are ensuring that as we update these policies and do this work, that our practices and policies are the same. Um, and so a couple of things within our commencement. Um, and one was um, caught language-wise by, by a board member, and so a couple things that we will be looking to change and probably not ask for passage tonight, but just quick review. Um, one is the practice. Um, within the current commencement participation 522, there is not a statement that allows students to miss out on commencement. While we don't want any students to miss out on commencement, there are times where students engage in behaviors the day of or the day before commencement that would bore them from successful participation. Um, significant disciplinary or behavior incidences. 
Um, we have suggested some language in here, um, but that we have also gotten feedback from the board packet to change that um, to basically be more clear. Um, we had put in here, unless participation is denied for appropriate reasons, which may include discipline. Um, so we are going to be adding revising to that statement with the exception of students who are ineligible to participate for disciplinary reasons that have been approved by the Richfield High School principal and the superintendent. Um, and so as the things that we've done when we have students miss out on significant events, we want to make sure that those two sets of eyes and so making sure that that would go through the high school principal and also the superintendent. Um, we also noted, um, pointed out by a board member that um, as we also implemented just recently a gender inclusion policy, use of his, hers, um, is not appropriate terminology and is gender specific. Um, and so we are looking to remove that, um, just, just make a statement of all qualifications being met. Um, and so those are the couple of updates um, and we need to clean that up. So we're not asking for passage tonight, just review. Um, and we'll come back with that cleaned up for our next meeting. Thank you. Unless there are additional questions. Question. So uh, I'm, I'm understanding that, am I understanding correctly that the um, Discipline, the disciplinary reasons approved by the high school principal and the superintendent that we are talking about the principal and the superintendent exercising judgment at that point in time as opposed to an administrative guideline that outlines some set of disciplinary reasons? Correct. And pretty typically it would be a suspendable type incident for which a student would be eliminated from school um, and or they are actually inappropriate at the time to participate. Um, public intoxication the day of graduation, for example, or... Um, things of that nature that would be, obviously, we would take that very seriously, but it would yep. definitely be judgment. Yep. And I think that's what I appreciate about the language change is that it shows that it would need to be a very, very high bar that both the principal and the superintendent are involved in in order for us to say that a student could not participate in commencement, so. So this will come back at our next meeting. This will come back at our okay. next meeting, and if there's any other updates, um, Please let me know. Uh, so next are board policies 302 and 301. They're in our packet in that order. They're in our packet in that order. Um, and then I'm going to talk about them both together. Um, so these okay. are yearly policies that come up this time as we have um, staffing changes. Um, this also acknowledges sometimes there are changes in roles for the Board of Education. And so these are updated in there. Um, so for example, um, it acknowledges who chair, vice chair, clerk, and treasurer are. Um, and so those changes aren't always updated in January when those changes occur. Um, and then those also update the staffing components. So just as a reminder, um, we have um, new principal, um, Colleen Mahoney at Centennial Elementary. We have new assistant principal, John Cook. Um, we have at uh, Richfield High School, we have director of marketing communications, Jennifer Valley. Um, and then we also have um, Mr. Mike Wallace, who is no longer with us. Um, and so those three changes are put in in regard to our position assignments. Um, and then also the um, org chart has been updated accordingly um, without the um, director of mathematics and with the addition for the director of Ma uh, marketing and communications. Um, and as you see, this is one of those things that comes up every single year. I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. Why are the numbers not in order? <laughs> <laughs> My OCD is a So bit. the reason for those not being in you order, and you, no, I, you're gonna laugh me. because it's funny. The, um, <laughs> the org chart was more difficult to update um, because it is in a program that is obsolete at this time. And so we are in the process of redoing that. So as we put together the packet 302, we were able to update quite quickly and easily. Um, and 301 took a lot more complex technology usage. <laughs> and so that ended up in, an, in a 302, 301 order. It's really painful. It is <laughs> yeah. designed to drive people crazy, yes. And then the other, uh, so, I'm a, so are we getting another director of math? We are not getting a director of mathematics. Um, and so as we obviously have talked about at the board level and made some position or made some reductions across our district, um, we did not in this current year's budget make a um, reduction in regard to district office staffing. Um, we have implemented some systems to support ensuring that our mathematics improvement and rollout continues, um, but we decided to utilize that as a reduction from our management team um, in our, in our cost-saving measures across our district. And so what we're looking for is a motion to approve the revisions to board policies 302 and 301. Did you have a question? I was just going to move the policy. That sounds great. <laughs> Let's do that then. 
I would like to move the policy as presented. I'll second. Um, so we have a motion by Mr. Tensing and a second by Ms. Cole. Any discussion? I have one clarification. Yes. Peter said singular, the policy. There are policies. Policies, 301 and 302. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I second that. Wonderful. Um, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye, and policies 302 and 301 are approved. Uh, next, we have a resolution to call a school board election on Tuesday, November 5th. Um, so obviously, as we have already begun this business a couple of months ago, um, there are a couple of other dates and date requirements for us to move forward through as a board. Um, as we know, there will be an election on November 5th. We are now in the time window where it is required for this board to take action to take a resolution to officially call said election into passing. Um, and so um, before you, you have that resolution. You also have the sample ballot with our um, six candidates who would be up, um, who have put their names in. Um, Crystal Brackey, Paula Cole, <laughs> Tim Dallum, Susie Lutenegger, Julie Olmsted, and Allegris Missick. Um, and so those six candidates plus optional write-ins would be on the ballot. Um, within this um, outlines the process that occurs um, and um, all of the things that we need to legally comply with to move forward with the election. So we're moving that forward for a resolution this evening. I will move that we approve the resolution as presented. I will second. So we have a resolution by Mr. Ketzing and a second by Mr. Paulus. Is there any discussion? As this is a resolution, I will pull the board. Mr. Ashmead. Aye. Mr. Tensing. Aye. Ms. Cole. Aye. Ms. Malik. Aye. Mr. Paulus. Aye. The chair votes aye and the resolution is approved. Um, and the last item of new business is the official donation that was um, ceremoniously presented at our last meeting by Bill Davis from the Spartan Foundation. Yes, and so we wanted to hold off. We didn't actually have the list of the 25 names at that time, but we wanted to make sure that we also acknowledge 25 of our high school students who were scholarship recipients of our $25,000 check from the Spartan Foundation received at our last meeting. And so in addition to thanking the Spartan Foundation, which, which we did at our last meeting, um, we also want to recognize our scholarship recipients, including Phoebe McCartan, Joel Schaefer, Lynn Tran, William Voigt, Micah White, Demetrius Coleman, Estefania Gonzalez Ramirez. Estefania. Estefan Estefania. Estefania. Diem Tran, Maria Valdez, Catherine Urzura Para, Yulema Aguiar Garcia, Brian Contreras, Dorcas Mayawa Dewu, Francine Legba, Mumtas Mohammed, Catherine Reyes Garcia, Destiny Ross, Eric Gil Rosas, Don Jameson, Thomas Kimis, Tenson Woser, Aaron Zambrano Vega, Maggie Bowie, Evan Hall, and John Dominic Poyatos. Congratulations to our students. Madam Chair, I will move that we accept these donations with gratitude yeah, and with pride. Mm -hmm. I'll second. So we have a motion by Mr. Tetzing and a second by Ms. Malik. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye and these very generous donations to our students are accepted with uh, our thanks and pride. Uh, so we will move into the advanced planning section of the agenda. As always, we have time for a legislative update from the superintendent or any board members that have legislative business to share. Oh. I have nothing. <laughs> Go right ahead, Steve. Good. Um, the only thing I have is in my role on the Pelsby Board. Um, and Pelsby stands and for. And Pelsby stands for the <laughs> Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board, which is how um, teachers get licensed in the state of Minnesota. Um, and teachers also update their licenses. Um, one of the conversations we're currently having is around cultural competency training, which is expected of all teachers within the state. Um, there are some cultural competency trainings that are developed, um, and then there are those that are yet to be approved. Um, currently, the only one approved has been um, put together by the Pelsby Board um, and supported by the Pelsby Board. And so what we are working on is working with our team from Innocent Classroom and our Teaching and Learning Department to determine um, if our cultural competency training is um, satisfactory for the requirements of relicensure. 
Um, and if not, what things would need to be added. But we're working to collaboratively to help support our teachers in the ongoing licensing process um, since we have trained all our teachers in Innocent Classroom or will have by the end of this coming week. Um, and so that's an exciting thing as an update, but then also one of the things we're working on collaboratively um, with our team. You know, actually, I misspoke. I do have one item, which is really not so much an information item as much as it is a uh, sort of a reminder to my fellow board members. Um, we are coming around to that time of year again when we start um, legislative advocacy. Um, and so we're only probably, uh, well, maybe six months out from when we'll hopefully have an opportunity to meet with our own legislative delegation. Um, we want to be prepared to be thinking about what our legislative priorities are going to be for this year. So I just want to put that out there um, for people to start thinking about. Um, and maybe, maybe would it be helpful for um, in our next board packet to just get a copy of last year's legislative priorities, um, just as a reminder um, for folks so they can see kind of um, what was important last year. We can give an update on what was accomplished. We can see what still remains to be done. And then maybe we can have those conversations in November, December timeframe. Um, the the one legislative item I was going to share is I received a letter from the Minnesota School Board Association um, informing us that Representative Michael Howard, who represents parts of Richfield and Bloomington, was named a legislator of distinction for 2019 by the School Board Association. And so just wanted to acknowledge that I just received that notice. And so we'll do something to ensure that we formally commend him um, for that really great honor. Um, and his work representing our communities. Uh, so let's move on to information and or questions that members of the board have that they would like to share with each other or with the public. I just want to give a big shout out to the organizers of the back to school event. Uh, yes. Great success, well attended, uh, really great. So it was extraordinary. Yes. Yes, we learned that they gave out um, 750 backpacks um, before running out and estimated over a thousand people were in attendance. Um, and so looking at ways to continue that type of event and improve it in the future. And so we're very thankful to um, the city and the police partnership that helped launch this event and really do some of the organizational work of an exciting new opportunity for our city. Yeah, second, ditto. Kudos on uh carrying it off and I think we all look forward to uh, how the event can be improved and in the future and we'll all be in our CQI modes so yeah. Could I ask for a reminder of some of the key dates that are coming up relating to uh, welcome backs to staff and students in open houses? Right, so tomorrow morning um, at Ridgefield <laughs> Middle School at 8 o'clock is the new teacher breakfast. New licensed staff. New licensed staff, yes, thank you for that correction. Uh, new licensed staff breakfast. Um, and then on the 27th is the district launch. And so it's a week from Tuesday, and that is also at Richfield Middle School. Um, and I believe we are also at eight o'clock. Um, open houses, I believe, for the most part, are Thursday of that same week. And so that would be the 30th of August? 29th of August, thank you, Miss Mary. Um, and they're spread out throughout most of the day. Um, and they're across a wide variety of locations, obviously, and with some of that flexing, depending on where our buildings are. Steve, am I wrong to think that the middle school open house is gonna be in the morning? I believe it's nine to noon. Why? Um, there have been a wide range of requests for different times for open houses. Um, and we've really continued to evolve in how we're offering our open houses. Um, and so one of the things is, is that if we hold them all at, in the evening, we have people who are not satisfied because they can't attend an elementary, middle, and a high school at the same time. Um, and so we're really- at night. What's that? Or are working at night. Or are working at night, and right. So we are trying to figure out um, what those best times are. And, and typically people are trying to align those to the best times that they have gotten feedback from their communities. Um, but it, is, it continues to be a tough challenge for us to figure out how to best serve through our open houses. Yeah. And the information packet is very informative, uh, I guess, for people who cannot attend. But you had a lot of forms okay. uh, that I think would be helpful to 
tu family esté de welcome packets are already mailed to the homes. We will pass that on to Jennifer in communications also as she will be examining our processes and really looking at how, how to improve. Um, Thank you for that. I had one question that we may not have an answer to this evening, but it is also along the construction lines. This time it is the road construction that is happening at 70th and Lindale that I imagine would have a huge impact on our high school community and whether we know if that intersection and that stretch of Lindale is going to be open and ready for the first day of school. Don't anticipate it. Yeah, it doesn't look that way. So then I think my question around that would be planning and communication and anything that we would need to do because that is a pretty main thoroughfare for people getting to the high school. Including the buses, right? So we, <laughs> a couple of years ago, when one of the, when the eternal 66th street do over was going on we we had buses that were routinely late because of the, the, con the construction surprised us but it shouldn't have and this is a this is an example of one whatever the bus routes are to make sure that they are ready to deliver and and, and get to their routes with, without using lindale app right we are collaborating with the city and they are providing us regular updates um, we don't know the exact time on lindale at this point um, in the sun current it suggested september october um, for an opening, which is obviously a very wide window. Um, but yes, as we, as we are working out on, on our transportation routes, we are not assuming that there will be an easy open path to, to Lindale like that. And, and, and we have a generous sense of understanding for how construction projects go and that there's yes, a vague, right. vague end date. Yes. It's so, like but, whenever but we, it's before snows, right? Correct. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. We just need to make sure it, we are aware that that road is closed. Yes. And we're aware as we sit here now. So we need to make sure we are prepared to deliver on the students to the buildings on time. And I'm thinking, you know, this draft letter going out to RHS families mm -hmm. next week, perhaps we should add something related to Lindale and transportation um, to that letter. I think that would be a missed opportunity, maybe, if we didn't do that. I'm okay. seeing the nods from our communication. Thank you. Anything else? Um, I was asked a question by a board member about pre-K or for a pre-K well, yeah. enrollment update. Yeah. Um, and we don't, and overall enrollment. So enrollment, obviously, as we know, is very gray at this time. We don't necessarily know on paper. We are up at all of our schools on paper. Um, but as we know, on paper enrollment and in-person enrollment can often be very different. Um, and pre-K, it is different because people have come in, filled out paperwork, and um, completed everything necessary. Um, I am pleased that, um, just as a reminder, Centennial, two full day uh, sections of pre-K, all full. Um, RDLS, two full day sections, all full. RSTEM, one full day section, in, an AM and a PM. Um, full for the full day, full for the PM, and two openings in the AM. Um, Sheridan Hills, an AM and a PM half day programs, both full. Um, and then Centen or Central has an AM, a PM, and a second AM. Uh, the PM is full. And then there are two spots in the AM in one class and 13 in the other class for the, for the AM. Um, and so basically we're looking at 17 AM half-day slots are open. Uh, we still do have eight on the waiting list that we're working our way through. Um, four additional um, applications we haven't processed. We have yet to open it up to out of district at this time because we wanted to make sure up until middle end of next week when we're sure um, we we feel confident we can fill the slots but we don't want to really push for or out of out of district until we really feel like thank you for the update that because two weeks ago we we received a broader update you know mm -hmm. and we, we understand that the, the numbers change and i knew that we would go to the non-resident list at some point yes. if there was room for, from a practical standpoint right. but i just wanted to know how, how close we were to that so thank you we're thinking mid next week yes Thank you for following up on that. Mm -hmm. um, our next meeting will take place on Tuesday, September 3rd. So not our traditional Monday at 7 o'clock p.m. because of the Labor Day holiday. Um, do we know yet whether we will be in this room or whether we will be back in the traditional district boardroom? We don't know for sure. The sidewalk is down okay. and, and in place. Um, we are looking at how progress is coming in the administrative offices over there and if we can be over there functionally and it can be cleaned, updated, and ready. Um, so I don't know, um, but we'll make sure to know by early next week. We two on the board are rolling with day-to-day <laughs> -day changes mm -hmm. and we'll do our best to make sure that the location is clear and well-published. Um, 
Are there any suggested or future agenda items? So before we move to that, we have to talk about the November meeting because we really need to do that in advance, if that's okay. Please. Um, so we are in an interesting quirk in terms of our November meeting and canvassing the election. Um, and so canvassing the election must occur within 10 days of the election. Um, and so as we look to November, what our regularly scheduled meetings were, um, we had a meeting set on November 4th, the day before the election. Yep. The next meeting is not until November 18th, which is 13 days after the election and outside of the time window that is allowable to canvass the election. Okay. Now, making it more awkward, we're not allowed to hold a meeting on November 11th related to the election on Veterans Day, which is on the next Monday, okay. which means that we would need to look at an alternative date um, with the logical options, since we have done Tuesdays, possibility of Tuesday, November 12th. Um, or we could do it later in the week after the election, Wednesday the 6th or, when, or Thursday the 7th of November. And so I just wanted to put out those dates to board members to determine when we could have a quorum to canvass the election um, to, to take care of that. And we don't need to decide that at the moment, but we clearly would need to move that, move that meeting. Um, can we perhaps have Mary send an email to collect board member availability on those couple of options that you just said, and then we will make a decision based on what we hear back from individuals? Great. Okay, thank you. Um, any suggested or future agenda items I, that have not already come up? I, I do want to comment on, on the heels of, of that discussion. Historically, we have not had a meeting the eve before the oh, election yes. itself, and so we, we have one scheduled for that Monday. Um, you know, the eve before a school election. Mm -hmm. And so um, just to avoid all kinds of conflicts. So um, it, yeah. that meeting should be yes. pretty, be viewed as portable, I think. We, yes. we just, but we have to decide soon enough so that it can be, yes. it can be functional for what we need and also communicated. Correct, so Mary will follow up, assuming we're moving the meeting from the Monday to Wednesday, Thursday, or the next Tuesday, or if those don't work, we will find a different time, with, again, within that two week window, where, or 10 day window, where we can have a quorum of the board to canvass the election. Tuesday meetings, in flux. Exactly. We will have the date set by the time of our next board meeting. Let's commit to that. Okay, one last time. Suggested or future, future agenda items that have not already been named. Great. Um, so our thanks to everyone for being here this evening, especially those of you that stuck through to the end. Um, have a wonderful, wonderful last few weeks of summer and we'll see everybody back on the first day of school for our next board meeting. Um, with that, we could entertain a motion to adjourn. So. Oh. Is that Mr. Tensing or Mr. Ashmead? Let's give it to John. Okay. He really wanted it. I'll second. Great. So we have a motion by Mr. Ashmead and a second by Mr. Tensing. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye and the meeting is adjourned at 8.52 p.m.